Good morning. Yeah, hi. I'm the uh, chief operating officer for the Federal Highway Administration in California. I'm very happy to uh, see you all here today. It's great that Caltrans decided to host this forum, you know, to get Caltrans people together with consultant and contractors to discuss contracting. Obviously, contracting is challenging, you know, from the get go from trying to prepare an RFP or a bid for a contract. And once you get it, actually carrying it out is not easy. I mean, if there's anything the government is good at, we have lots and lots of uh, regulations, laws, policies, procedures, forms to fill out. So it's, uh, you know, and Caltrans really does an absolutely fantastic job with uh, doing things like this and working day to day to try to uh, sort out those, uh, uh, you know, regulations and how things have to go in order to be, uh, uh, you know, successful in performing contracts. So. Um, thank you again, Caltrans, for putting this on and allowing me to participate in a small way. Um, you know, for both Caltrans and FHWA, you know, our goal for small businesses, DBEs, DVBEs, is for them to be successful, right? And bottom line, being successful is being doing a great job, you know, providing high quality works so that improves our transportation system, but really, even more so as being profitable, right? And I mean, we want you to be profitable, no doubt about it. Um, our job as FHWA is to give money away. You know, that is our primary focus is to give money away. And hopefully you get it and use it in a manner where the owners and the staffs of the companies that get contracts, you know, can have a good wage to give their families a good quality of life. I mean, that's the bottom line. You know, we we want transportation system to be improved. We want your families to have a, a uh, you know, be able to have a good life. Um, FHWA, we, uh, we are the organization that imposes the DB program on Caltrans. They have to do it if they accept the $4 billion that we give them every year. And believe it or not, they do not turn their back on that $4 million billion. So they, uh, uh, have to have a successful DBE program. It's a huge focus for both Caltrans and FHWA. We both spend a lot of time and effort trying to improve that program to make it a better program for the DBEs themselves. Um, you know, FHWA's specific role is primarily working directly with Caltrans. You know, we work with them to pr improve policies, processes, and communications to provide more and better opportunities for the for the DBEs. We work uh, really closely with uh, the Office of Civil Rights, the Division of Local Assistance, and the Division of Construction, you know, to remove any barriers that they may have in place unknowingly or try to make those barriers shorter and also um, provide resources, uh, uh, you know, to support the DBEs. We also have a great opportunity, FHWA, is we, uh, we meet with Caltrans and the uh, contracting community subcontractors at AGC and Yukon regularly scheduled meetings. So it, it's really a good opportunity to talk directly with the contractors and the consultants and see what's working well, what needs to be changed, what information we can provide, resources we can provide to, so it's uh, more helpful. Um, FHWA, also has two specific funding programs to get allow individuals to get into the transportation industry and DBEs to um, successfully complete compete for contracts. One of them is the on the job uh, training supportive services program, and that allows individuals to get work to be trained and get work with contractors. Um, so that's uh, the benefit there really is to the individuals. Then we have a DB supportive services program that's designed to help DB or companies become DBEs, be certified, be able to know how to get bonding, um, know how to execute a bid and submit it to the contractors, you know, and so that is specifically designed to get those 
small companies everything they need to be equipped to successfully be awarded a subcontractor or a prime contract. Um, you know, from my viewpoint, uh, I've only been in California for four years, um, but even in that short period of time, the DBE programs increased tremendously. We are, I think we're about 18% of our funds are given directly to uh, DBE firms, which is phenomenal. It is a large amount of money. Um, also, uh, you know, at the UConn and AGC meetings, when I first got here, we talked about the DBB program occasionally, and it was mostly reporting. But now, in every meeting we have with the uh, contractors, um, it's a specific focus of several agenda topics, and we are constantly seeking contractor input and subcontractor input, you know, how to make this program better. And we believe it is. So, and the bottom line is, you know, we're continuing to get more DBEs work every year. So that's a, that's a good indicator. You know, and so about contracting, about all I have to say, I know Tykert's here to give you a lot of great tips. Um, but, you know, I'll just tell you this, make sure you know the contractor before the contract before you sign it. Even if you've worked with that same owner numerous times, I mean, the devil's in the details they can change provisions because of experiences they've had on previous contracts or new uh, uh, state or federal requirements so every contract you get into or you're wanting possibly to uh, bid on make sure you know the details because uh, i mean th there's some stuff in there <laughs> that can trip you up if you don't realize it's in there um so i mean i just uh, i'm very happy to see that tigers here that they are going to uh, give you a lot of those great tips. And I be, believe Abigail Brown is gonna give some good information afterwards. Um, so this should be a really, really good workshop. So that's all I have for you. I hope you have a great workshop and uh, thanks for allowing me to be here. So our next presenter um, is Jason Serio. Uh, Jason is the chief estimator for Tycor Construction in the Bay Area. And I'm going to turn things over to Jason now. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Paul. Um, yeah, I'm the chief estimator, um, as Jessica said, um, in the Bay Area for Public Works. Um, we bid uh, public and private projects all over the state. Um, the ones I kind of focused on are the ones in the um, San Francisco and Monterey Bay areas, but also involved with uh, stuff out of District 3 in the Valley and in, in, in District 10 and in District uh, 6. And then we also have, um, we have offices in Monterey and San Francisco or in uh, Pleasanton and um, Woodland and Lincoln and Stockton and Fresno, California. And then we have a utilities division that has offices in Chino Hills and Long Beach and San Diego. So we, we, we pretty much cover the, um, the whole state. Um, so if there's a, uh, any work in those areas, um, we're always interested in, uh, you know, finding new partners, especially DBEs and small businesses, but finding new partners and, and vendors to work with. And as part of that, um, kind of wanted to, we wanted to share some uh, general contract information uh, for uh, not just the public projects, and I'm going to kind of focus a little bit on the uh, the Caltrans side of it, uh, because they're uh, gracious enough to uh, host this uh, forum, but also want to um, talk about some of the provisions, even on you know private projects. It's um, whether you're uh, doing work on either. Um, a lot of the tips that we have learned and want to share, um, uh, you know, work in both scenarios, and um, and also you know this kind of want to share that this is our. This is our point of view, um, you know, from our from our history, and and not just our history as being a prime, but we're also a subcontractor to um, uh, to many different uh, owners and also other companies. And um, you know, we rec we actually recently shared this with some uh, our District Four Mentor Protege Program, and part of that program is Kiwit and Granite Rock and Granite and um, and uh, uh, gelati construction 
and they all this is this is these um, same things that we're going to discuss hold true for them as well. We all kind of see this stuff in the same way. Um, so just to kind of go over real quick topics, we're gonna, we'll run through um, where to find Caltrans plans and specs the standards for where to find the standards, uh, tips for reviewing them, and then a little bit about Caltrans uh, bid opening and results and their award process. And then we'll get into, uh, uh, you know, some of the contract information uh, from the prime to vendor contracts, uh, a little bit about bonding, uh, insurance and indemnity, uh, changes in condition and extra work, delays, penalties, and LDs, and this dispute resolution and attorney's fees. And so those last uh, five or six topics there, those are more about, you know, once once you've, you're a little better together or whatever, um, you get in the contract, how, you know, tips you want to make sure that contract looks like or what to expect when you see that contract. Um, first off, the uh, where to find Caltrans plans and special provisions. Uh, so Caltrans does a great job with their advertisement where it's all in one central location, easily to get to. Um, so if you um, go to their Caltrans uh, contractors corner and you click on advertisement and click on all advertised projects, it'll show every single project that is advertised. They also have, you can see there this week, prior week, next week, week after next for the ones that are um, um, coming out. Uh, but when you click on that all advertised projects, what's what you're going to see is all the currently advertised projects, and you're going to see a long list of hopefully uh, longer the better. That means there's more work out the bid, uh, but you're going to see all these projects out there, and they're going to look like this, where you're going to see um, the contract number, in this case is 04-0A, a little bit of a description of the project, when the uh, date advertised is when the documents are coming out, when it's going to bid, the engineer's estimate, uh, if there's any DBE or DVB requirements, and then also um, the prime contractors looking for help, you know, ones that are uh, needing help, and then the opt-in records are, are people that are, um, that are expressed interest in bidding the project. Uh, but up there, kind of um, highlighted uh, project plans and then the notice to bidders and special provisions. You click on those, uh, that, that, that'll give you the bid documents. I, I always also look at the list of bid items. That's always um, a good thing to click on and look for to see what is bidding, to see what the scopes are. That's what, that's what I look at. Um, Caltrans has an um, organized set of bid items, which are basically in the same order by scope and same description of bid item, uh, no matter what the project is, no matter what the district is. So that's always a really good uh, quick check to see if uh, your scope of work is on the project, if it's something that you might be interested in bidding. Uh, where to find Caltrans standards? So uh, Caltrans uh, standards, they have um, an electronic version. I think it's only electronic version now available. Um, if you search for Caltrans standards or there's the link uh, pro provided there in the, in the slide and a, a PDF will, of this will be made afterwards if you, if you want that link. But in there, it's the 2000, right now it's the 2018 version with um, some updated revisions. And I wanna highlight this, uh, whether you're actually bidding Caltrans work or not, uh, you know, every, every agency has different standards and different specs, as everybody's probably well aware. Um, the nice thing about Caltrans is the standard plans and specs, you know, they're the same for the whole state. So it doesn't matter what district that you're working in, you know that these are going to be the standard plans and specs. Um, but also it's good to know these, uh, know the standard plans and specs for Caltrans because many other agencies um, use them, uh, either use them as their own, or um, if a project is, uh, especially if it's um, maybe um, in the Caltrans right, right away portion of the project, the local agency will still uh, utilize Caltrans standard plans and specs. And uh, finally, with that, um, a lot of local agencies 
you know, there's, they don't maybe address every single issue and they will uh, say, they will default to Caltrans standard plans and specs for anything that's not specifically addressed. Uh, we also see just about every agency refers to a Caltrans spec. Sometimes it's different. It could be a 2006, a 2016, 2018 for um, like for asphalt paving um, and for uh, sometimes for concrete or earthwork. So uh, the, I just recommend to uh, anybody that these are it's a, good to have these as a basis of knowledge um, for when you're, especially when you're bidding any work in the public arena. And finally, you can sign up for email notifications of changes. So as uh, revisions are updated to the standard plans and specs, um, you will get a notification of those changes. That That is uh, very, very helpful. Tips for reviewing the uh, plans and specs. So one of the nice things that I personally like about uh, bidding Caltrans work is that um, Caltrans design standards, it doesn't matter which district it is, they basically have the same design standards throughout the state. And that means the plan layout, um, the location of the plan. So kind of on the right there, you see the index of plans uh, with uh, project layout, utility plans, drainage, electrical, and the structures at the end. This is the order of plans on every single Caltrans project. This, this is the order. If, if there's drainage, it's going to be kind of in that location on every single Caltrans project. So it makes it uh, very easy uh, when you're bidding a project, uh, say you just want to uh, uh, bid the, the striping, right? You know what plan sheets to look for and where to look for them. You kind of have a pretty good idea of where to, where to look right off the bat. You don't have to go through you know, a couple hundred sheets or could even be a large projects, a couple thousand sheets of plans to find your scope. You have a pretty good handle of exactly where it's gonna be. Um, same thing with the um, special provisions. So the way that the Caltrans one ones work, and it, it kind of be a little difficult to understand at first. Um, so normally, you know, you're used, you're used to a lot of local agencies, they'll put out a spec book and it can be, you know, a couple hundred pages to a couple thousand pages, depending on the size of the project. Really, the similar size project from Caltrans, the specials are probably, you know, 10 to 20 percent of the length. And, and that's because what they're doing in the specials, they're not repeating what's in the standards already. They're just telling you what's different. Um, so say the in this case, uh, they're saying in the specials that they want to place the PCMS as the portable changeable message signs um, at these locations. So this is different than what's in the standards. So again, this is another important thing. If you know the Caltrans standards, it's the same on every single Caltrans project. So all you really need to do is look at these specials and just look at the changes and understand the changes. So from our perspective with bidding, it makes the Caltrans projects a lot easier to bid because it, it just, there's not, um, you know, there's not these surprises or, or hidden requirements in the specials that are difficult to find. Um, the other thing, just like the plans, the specifications, they're set up in the same structure numbering system on every single project. So uh, real easy to find. So like the traffic control charts telling you when you can uh, do lane closures and essentially do work on the project. It's in the same spot in the specials on every single project. So you find a Caltrans project that you want to bid either as a prime or as a sub and you uh, bid the project, you submit your bid and um, you to the uh, vendor and you want to see the result. So the nice thing about uh, uh, Caltrans um, that they have moved to the electronic bidding, which definitely helps with the submittal uh, process, but also uh, 
is good because uh, you don't have to send the bid runner to the bid opening to find out uh, who won or or what or what the how the how the uh, bid opening results are. You can attend them online, so uh, provides that uh, instant um, information that uh, you might be looking for. So if you uh, search for Caltrans bid opening, uh, this uh, website. Their website for electronic bidding will appear, and uh, there is a PDF for the electronic bid opening webcast and the instructions for it. And there is a link to a WebEx. And um, normally, it, you know, bids close at two o'clock, and normally by about two fifteen, you'll they'll have um, downloaded and read the openings two fifteen to two thirty, depending on how many projects have bid. Um, but, uh, so th that's, if, if you're bidding as a sub, you can always attend that and see which, uh, prime, uh, won the bid. And also, obviously, if you're bidding as a prime, you can see if you won the bid. Um, the other thing to look at is, so normally within 24 hours, Caltrans posts, um, a preliminary result on the bid opening and then a final bid summary. So the preliminary summary, if you're a vendor that's uh, expecting to be a listed subcontractor, um, uh, if you're over the listing limit, you will have been listed, uh, the low subcontractors will be listed by the various primes and that will be who was who listed and what items they were listed for will be published there on the preliminary summary. So, it's, uh, which is nice because I know sometimes it can be difficult to get a hold of the prime after the bid to find out, you know, one, how you did or if you got the project or not. So, uh, Caltrans provides this uh, nice method for you to be able to look up and see one who was low, obviously. And, but also um, which subcontractors were listed and for what items they were listed for. And this just kind of tells you, again, contractor's corner, click on the bidding link, click on preliminary bid summary, and then search for uh, both the date of the bid opening and the uh, contract number to find your results. All right, uh, Caltrans award. So again, Contracts corner, contractor's Corner is the place to go for just about everything there. Uh, we want to go to Contractor's Corner, click on um, Awards, and click on Award Status. So uh, and then, uh, you can select the desired contract number from a pull-down list, and it'll show you who they're processing the award for. So this is, um, I know a lot of vendors, you're, you know, you find out, hey, you were listed, or you find out from the contractor that you were um, used uh, by them for the project. And now you're wondering, okay, when, when's the project gonna start, right? You wanna be able to plan your resources accordingly. And so this is really good, that, so you can tell um, uh, when it's going to get awarded. So award recommendation, that's normally pretty much the bid date. And then, um, Civil rights evaluation. So, if there's DVBE or DBE uh, requirements, it'll go through that process. And then also funding certification and finally ready for award. So, once uh, once it's gone through those processes and, and it's ready for award, that award date, it's um, normally the contractors, normally the contract is sent out not too much longer after that. And uh, when you see that approval date, Normally the project, there's an NTP, maybe to a month after that, kind of depending on, um, like in this case, this one was approved in uh, December. So uh, there might, it might uh, be a little bit longer until, you know, maybe temperatures are right and, and weather is uh, right for them to be able to actually start the project. But that kind of gives you an idea, um, you know, shortly after that approval date, if you're a vendor, you should be getting a your contract from the prime that's when you would be expecting it shortly after that date i would imagine all right and so of course when you're expecting that contract uh want to kind of go over uh some of the um the different types of contracts that you might see and then why you might see them so the, these are um uh, 
a little more Tykert specific here. But uh, as, as I said before, uh, most of the other primes, they're going to, they're going to, they, they handle their contracts to vendors very, in a very similar fashion. So for us, subcontracts are for services being performed over $25,000. So it's a little bit longer form contract that will be sent out. Um, service orders are for services for work performed under $25,000. A little, little simpler language uh, um, when it's that dollar amount. Purchase orders, they're typically for scopes that do not involve labor, but they're also used for trucking. Um, so, you know, different materials, essentially, for, mostly for materials. And the professional service agreements, we use those for, you know, particularly engineering, um, surveying, biologists, um, you know, QSD, QSPs, the sweepy plan, stuff like that. Um, so from the prime, you're going to receive, you should receive something, one of these or a similar named uh, contract. So what we would say is they all require some type of evaluation and a response. Uh, one, they've been developed and reviewed by the prime's attorney. So you want to make sure to read the contract. Um, uh, you know, these obviously these contracts are, are, are set up to protect the prime, and, but you also want to make sure that you uh, feel that you're protected as well. Um, in those um, contracts, uh, the prime could take exception, exception to terms in your proposal letter. You may, you know, you might exclude something that's still required by the, by the, by the actual contract, or you may, uh, include something that we actually don't need. Um, there could be a lot of different things that the prime might uh, not agree to in your original proposed letter. So the prime will send that back to you with what they um, either agree to or not. And then it's your, it's up to you to kind of decide, are you okay with those changes or not? And um, that normally kind of begins that discussion point. One, um, Make sure that the contract defines the payment terms, how you are going to get paid and when you're going to get paid. And also make sure the contract uh, clearly defines the scope and the location of the work. Um, obviously, we all want to make sure the scope is defined so that there's no uh, questions. Uh, that's a lot of times where um, uh, conflicts um, uh, begin and issues are. Um, for Tiger, is more specific to us. Uh, sometimes we will have uh, retention um, withheld on subcontracts. Kind of depends on our contract with the owner. Uh, I think Caltrans doesn't require retention anymore, so we don't require retention um, uh, for subcontracts when we're doing Caltrans work. But um, other agencies may require retention, or especially on private work, they might require retention. Um, we uh, will also normally require um, uh, payment and performance bonds for subcontracts, kind of depending on the value and, and, and the scope. Um, so, you know, on, on, on bid day, we'll either ask you, or it's even better if you have it on, on your um, quote already, you know, what your bond rate is, and uh, we'll pay for that. Uh, and then also always require insurance certificates uh, from the, um, from the subcontractor or if they're doing a service order. Uh, bonding. Um, so basic terms, bonding is a guarantee to the customer of financial ability to complete the contracted work. Uh, so most commonly there's the bid bond. So we provide a bid bond, a Republic Works contract that we bid and it guarantees that if we are awarded the work that we will enter into a contract with the owner. Then there's a payment bond, which uh, guarantees that we will pay our subcontractors and suppliers, thereby uh, limiting the liability of the owner. And, you know, even we'll require that of subcontractors to make sure that uh, our subcontractors are paying their um, vendors and suppliers as well. And then a performance bond, which guarantees that you'll complete the work on a timely basis. Uh, these are sometimes extended after completion as a warranty bond. 
this could be between the prime and the owner, the prime and the subcontractor, and we typically require them for subcontracts over $100,000. Requirements, the contract must be received from the owner prior to issuing the payment and performance bonds. So once the uh, contract is, say Caltrans sends us a contract, we will then procure the payment and performance bond and we send it back to Caltrans uh, with the, ex, you know, with the uh, signed uh, executed contract and our insurance information. Uh, one, you want to make sure you want to verify who pays for the bond. Typically, subcontractors exclude this. That's a almost a universal thing that it's excluded, and the prime will pay for the cost of the bond. Um, that's not not the case, obviously, when the prime is bidding to the owner, the owner is not paying for the bond separately. The prime will include that cost as part of their bid. And uh, for subcontractors, make sure that you uh, can provide your bond rate if requested. Um, and also even know your capacity. Uh, you wanna know if you have the capacity to bond the project that you're quoting. And you wanna know your bond rate. Um, and just make sure, yeah, if you're sending in uh, a quote on bid day, make sure you either, you know, have that information. Yeah, you're uh, put your bond rate on the quote or or you're available to answer that question uh, that comes up all the time. Insurance and indemnity. So insurance is your guarantee to the customer that you will pay for damages that, um, that are caused as a result of, of your work in general. The customer is always going to require that, that you have uh, workers' compensation, including a waiver of subrogation, uh, general liability insurance, and additional insured endorsements with um, the coverage shown as primary, and then automobile liability insurance. Those are pretty much standard on, doesn't matter if it's public or private. Um, you do need to keep an eye out for there are some agencies or some projects that, um, or even some primes that require um, higher than typical insurance limits. Uh, or also there can be uh, programs like uh, OSIPs, owner controlled insurance programs. Um, it's just stuff to make sure to look out for. And, and if you have a question about it before the bid, make sure you uh, talk to the prime that you're bidding to about it, or even, um, you know, you can state on your quote the insurance limits that uh, you have included, which we, which is pretty common to see. Indemnity to protect or hold harmless. Uh, you will be required by contract to protect our customers from damages caused by, you know, whether it's our actions and the actions of your subcontractors. So um, typically the owner's they want you to indemnify them to the maximum extent allowed by law. So this is something to kind of look, not necessarily with Caltrans, I would say this, but there's definitely some agencies and some projects where you want to be careful about um, the indemnification that they're requiring of you. Sometimes they'll go It'll go beyond your own negligence and require you to indemnify them for your shared responsibilities at a job site. Um, you're often called upon to indemnify the owner for everything up to, but not including the owner's sole negligence or willful misconduct. So you, you want to be kind of careful there. You know, say that you happen to be working on a job site and the prime has an issue or causes do, uh, damage at the uh, other side of the job site, you're not even there. Um, if they're having a shared responsibility clause uh, that you your insurance uh, could be kicked in to uh, help, well, you might have some liability there uh, with, with that issue. So something to be careful um, um, about, and it could also be when you're not even on the job site, say just because you're part of the part of the project. Um, so some, this is this is something that we look out for in contracts when we're bidding as a subcontractor to an owner. So something that we, as a tip, recommend to look out for as well. Changes in condition, extra work. You want to protect yourself. Obviously, this is one of the you know a lot of times the biggest issues, the biggest contentions is when there are changes in conditions and there is extra work. Hi, Jason. 
Real quick, yes. sorry to interrupt. Uh, you have uh, two questions before we get too far into it. Uh, Maria wanted to know, do street sweeper companies, are they required uh, to have bonding as well? Um, we do not, uh, for us, a street sweeper, I believe we put under either a service order. I believe it's under a service order. And uh, I don't I don't think it's typical, at least for other contractors, to bond a street sweeper. That would, I would imagine needing to do that. Okay. And then she also asked, uh, uh, is the indemnity something that they can exclude on their individual contract? Um, yeah, I mean, you can, so the contractor is always going to put something in there, um, with regards to indemnification. Uh, you can always either strike it or at least, um, what we typically do say the contractor has 1 of those shared indemnity clauses. We say that, uh, we, we try and change it and get it changed to where we're just indemnifying, um, for anything that we're directly involved in. So if Tiger causes damage, um, and directly causes uh, damage, we, you know, then yeah, we're liable for that, right? So uh, that you're not gonna probably be able to strike out of the contract. You know, people aren't gonna agree to that. Um, you're always gonna be liable for anything that you do, but uh, you should be able to, you know, maybe, get it stricken out about the shared identification. Gotcha. And then Ernest asked, um, let me back up. Oh, could you explain uh, or further explain the waiver of subrogation? The waiver of subrogation? Uh, no, I can't actually. <laughs> That's the one. <laughs> I know we require that. The, the insurance side of things is not necessarily uh, my uh, specialty. Um, but uh, also um, more than willing to, we do have uh, people within our company that can explain that a lot better. And also uh, uh, Sean Collins, our credit manager, he helps uh, uh, pretty often helps um, various vendors of our work through the insurance process and even the bonding process. If you have questions on that, on the more detailed insurance stuff or bonding uh, type issues, um, you can always send me the question and I can have um, one of our uh, people uh, help you out with that too. All right, uh, changes in conditions. Um, so number one, your you want your contract to detail what happens if there are changes, including extra work, uh, changes of contractor work, uh, or differing site conditions. Caltrans, it's pretty easy. It's in the standard specs, but every agency um, they have, you know, they'll say something different um, for what the requirements are, what notification requirements are, um, markups, everything. They're, they're all di they're all different. Uh, so, but either way, you want to make sure that you know the, the prime contract with the owner addresses it, but also the contract between the vendor and the prime addresses it as well. You want to make sure that it defines the method for identifying and notifying the customer of any differing site conditions and changes prior to proceeding with the work. And even if you are a, uh, a vendor, you want to make sure you know, say, like the Caltrans standards, because you'll be held to those same requirements that the, the prime is, especially when it comes to notification. Um, all changes should allow you to recoup cost, overhead, profit, and contract time. So you want to make sure that there are provisions for all three of these. I mean, if there's a change, obviously you still wanna get paid, but you definitely wanna get paid your cost, but you also wanna get paid um, overhead and profit for it. And a lot of times changes uh, result in delays. And so if um, it is, especially a public works project with uh, potentially liquidated damages associated with in a, a set amount of working days, you want to make sure if there's a change that you're able to uh, get additional contract time. And again, even though it's, you might be a subcontractor, this is still something that you want to make sure is in your uh, contract with the prime. Uh, because if uh, there's a, if there's a delay, especially if it's, you know, and it's associated with you, um, there, you have some 
potentially some liability with uh, liquidated damages yourself, even as a, as a vendor, if it goes over the contracted working days. Contract should define who is authorized to approve all change orders and or extra work on behalf of the customer. And obviously something you wanna get in writing. It is desired to have a minimum of five working days to notify customer of changes. For private work, that is uh, agencies will have different requirements, make sure to know what they are. Some contracts will say, hey, you have 24 hours to notify the customer or 48 hours. You wanna try and get uh, you know, five working days if you can in the contract to have some time to, for notification. For force account or time and material changes, an allowance of 60 days after completion of work to compile the cost, to give yourself the time to you know, work through your payroll, work through your processes and submit those costs. It also gives you uh, time if you have costs that are coming in from your own vendors and to be able to compile them. Again, agencies will have different requirements, so make sure uh, you know what they are. If you don't adhere to those requirements, um, you can lose your rights uh, to those changes at times. So very important to know the timeline um, that agencies have requirements for. You want to avoid language that prohibits you from pursuing the owner for claims as a subcontractor or um, language that requires you to pursue claims directly against the owner. So you want you want to, if it says that, uh, you know, if, if you're the subcontractor, you want to be able to um, go through the prime for a claim. And, uh, but also you want to have the ability to uh, pursue the owner for claim directly if you, if you require it. Um, and then uh, one of the top ones here, most people know this anyways, avoid performing additional work without written approval. Never, you know, always want to make sure you get that written approval uh, before um, doing any additional work. If not, it's easy way that everybody gets in trouble. All right, delays, penalties, and liquidated damages. Um, so contract should address the potential for compensable delays. So those are the ones that um, if there is a delay that you can uh, get money for the delay. Um, typically, these come because owner denial of access to the job site or equipment. Say uh, there's a utility in the way and um, and unforeseen that uh, it delays you and you, you can't perform your work. Um, or if there is a defect in design, that you can't construct the project, or just if the owner directs you to uh, um, stop work. Excusable delays, these are unavoidable, caused by circumstances beyond your control, acts of nature, these are, this is the description, public enemy, um, fire, flood, epidemics, um, strikes, governmental agency, freight embargo, and inclement weather. Till last year, never thought we'd have an epidemic affecting the contracts, but um, a little, little different over the over this last year. So again, these are um, excusable, and um, this is for you to be able to get additional time on the contract, but not necessarily compensable. You might not get paid for the additional time. Uh, Non-excusable delays, delays by you. Obviously, if you delay the project, um, that's on, that's on, and for not one of the reasons above, um, they're not gonna entitle you to additional time or compensation and may result in uh, you paying liquidated damages. Um, also applies to subcontractors, vendors that you hire, um, I know our contracts and typically Prime's contracts have language in there that, uh, you know, if you if you cause um, a non-excusable delay, and then if we're assessed liquidated damages or or whatever the costs are associated with that delay, that those would be applied to uh, the subcontractor. Uh, so you want to make sure that the contract says that you will be paid for compensable delays and that you will receive a time consideration for the compensable and excusable delays. So, um, and, and there are projects, and I've had projects where, you know, there's a, it's a, 
a calendar date deadline. So say like you have to, um, like an Army Corps project maybe where, um, associated project where you have to be out of, you know, the waterway by October 15th, right? Even if there's delays, you still have to get out of the waterway by October 15th. So sometimes the uh, time consideration or compensation could be um, acceleration, you know, via overtime or other met methods. Um, and then also as part of that, you want to make sure, you know, when there is a delay, normally you still have your overhead uh, um, cost that you're incurring. So you want to make sure that you're receiving compensation for any kind of cost, overhead or profits associated with the, with the delays. Um, and then you want to watch out for notice requirements that are less than 72 hours. So if you have less than 72 hours to notify the owner of prime of a delay, um, and also any clauses that address lost revenue. Um, so say uh, the, the, there's a delay in the project and it causes the owner um, extensive costs. Um, thinking in particular, maybe like a treatment plant, if there's a delay and they have to incur additional treatment costs, uh, those could be more expensive than the LDs. So kind of look out for those types of clauses that can be a lot more expensive than the daily LD if there's a delay. And then he, and, 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 and those kind of go along with uh, requiring a payment of consequential damages. So you want to be careful with those just because they're typically not address the dollar amount of what they are. So it's open-ended and uh, greater risk when it's open-ended. Dispute resolution and attorney fees. So the contract typically defines the rules that apply to dispute resolution, including court of jurisdiction and whether they're mediated or arbitrated. So the purpose is you want to provide a clearly defined dispute resolution process, including a predetermined path for escalation of dispute proceedings and resolution. Um, so before, uh, Caltrans, they now have bid items for dispute resolution board cost on basically every project, uh, at least the recent ones of we've been seeing. Um, so uh, this is a path for the Caltrans projects to get any issues uh, mediated. And you want to you want to look at that um, with other, whether it's on a private or public contract to see uh, how they're going to mediate them. This essentially it's for you to avoid court and avoid uh, um, the attorney's fees. Um, and also be careful, you know, we see some agencies that uh, state that there is no mediation or arbitration, you know, met, uh, path, uh, that they don't allow that. Um, you might want to be a little careful when you're bidding to that uh, agency or, or owner. Also, um, uh, you want to look at you know what's what what you want in the contract is that the prevailing uh, party receives the cost and attorney's fees. Um, all contracts should address the process of the dispute resolution because we talked about um, you want provisions for mediation and you want those provisions to be according to in standard industry guidelines. And you want discovery clauses that provide for review during normal business hours and upon reasonable advance notice. Again, you don't want, you know, hey, you have to tell us within, you know, 24 hours. Um, and then you want to be careful for looking out for any clause that requires you to resolve the dispute in a location other than where the project is located in a court within jurisdiction. We got sent something recently and I don't know why, but the jurisdiction was uh, for courts in um, the United Kingdom in a completely different country. So obviously that was something that uh, I, I think it was just a mistake, but that we weren't going to agree to. Um, you know, uh, say the company you're doing business with is uh, based out of, you know, um, Colorado, but you're doing work here in California. You don't want the jurisdiction to be in Colorado. You don't want to be flying back there if, if, if you have to go to a court case. Um, also, avoid an alternate dispute resolution that is so broadly written that includes non-contractual disputes such as tort liability. 
All righty, if there's any other just general questions or any questions about um, slides we went over, I'm open to uh, open to any 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 questions you guys might have. Uh, and she's asking, does Fisher do DBE and women owned business? Do you mean do they work with DBE or women owned businesses? Just need a little bit of clarification. Darlene. Okay, yes. She's wondering, um, Jason, whether or not uh, your firm works with DBE firms. Yes. Um, just uh, probably, you know, we do a lot of public works, about, about half of our work is public works, and half of that uh, involves. Um, uh, has has DBE and woman or woman owned uh, requirements, but uh, whether it does or not, I mean, just about all of our, you know, probably 75% of our work has a DBE involved um, some way or another, whether it's a requirement or not. We have uh, there's a lot of DBE companies that we've done work with um, over the years and, 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 you know, also worked with to, um, You know, try and help um, help build them up as a company so that they can, uh, you know, provide uh, the services that um, we and other contractors need. So, yes, we very common for us to work with DB and women-owned businesses. Okay. 